Morning, everyone. Uh, I think people are still straggling in uh, because of the rain and so on, but we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, and uh, without further ado, we'll bring John up for his formal remarks. Uh, John Cam really needs no introduction uh, in this space in, in human rights. Uh, he is an American businessman and human rights campaigner, and he's been active in China since 1972. He's the founder and chairman of the Dui Hua Foundation. He's been the recipient of several awards, including the Department of Commerce's uh, Best Global Practices Award by President Clinton in 1997, and the Eleanor Roosevelt Award for Human Rights by President Bush in 2001. And I think we can sum it up best uh, by the way the uh, New York Times decided to uh, comment on him. No other person or organization in the world, including the State Department, has helped more Chinese prisoners over his career. And so without further ado, I'd like to invite John to come up and give us some formal remarks, and then we'll go into question and answer after that. Thank you. Hmm. Hello. Are we, we all wired up? Sounds good. That's good. Well, thank you very much, Chris. It's a real pleasure to be here at the center. Um, and uh, I've heard good things about this building, but uh, not until you actually come here and uh, take a look, you appreciate. Now, I don't know if this is an improvement over the old building. Definitely. <laughs> uh, well, um, you know, I, I have my uh, uh, speech, uh, and it's uh, written up. Uh, and. Uh, I do that when I talk about sensitive subjects. I, if, if, uh, if there's to be any kind of official accounting of this, uh, it should be the speech. But I'm not going to sit here and read or stand here and read this speech. Instead, I'm going to work through it, uh, just as uh, all of our uh, teachers used to say, tell them what you're going to say, say it, and tell them what you said. And so I'm going to try to do that today. Um, and I'm going to try to keep it reasonably short. You know, I, I had an experience not too long ago where I was uh, sort of getting right into the substance of my speech when somebody stood up and walked out. And I, I called out to him. I said, sir, you know, I, I haven't, I haven't uh, finished my remarks. Um, where are you going? <laughs> and he said, well, I, I have to get a haircut. <laughs> I'm going to get a haircut. And I said, well, why didn't you get a haircut before you came here to listen to me? And he said, uh, well, before I came here to listen to you, I didn't need a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Today I'm going to talk about China's uh, human rights diplomacy. And uh, this, uh, these remarks are based on my own personal experience of working uh, with the Chinese government uh, for almost 25 years. Uh, they are, the remarks are based on my own observations, conversations, trips. I've made over 100 trips to China uh, to engage the government in what's known as the unofficial dialogue on human rights. And so my remarks are based on that experience. They do not reflect the views, obviously, of any government or any other organization but my own. Well, let's go back 25 years ago. International reaction to the events of the spring of 1989 in Beijing and other cities uh, compelled China for the first time to uh, defend its human rights record. After initially rejecting all criticism as interference in its internal affairs, uh, the country's leadership adopted a more nuanced approach. Uh, releasing large numbers of prisoners, granting passports to relatives of dissidents, reaching an agreement with the United States on uh, uh, the export of prison-made goods, that was in 1992, and uh, holding bilateral human rights dialogues, uh, initially with Switzerland and the United States, and then expanding that over the years. Uh, also, um, China's foreign minister uh, signaled a willingness to consider visits to prisons by the International Committee of the Red Cross. Now, this nuanced approach uh, was uh, approved by Deng Xiaoping, uh, carried out by a cadre of professional diplomats in uh, China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, 
and assisted by the State Council Information Office, with whom I worked uh, closely, uh, and judicial bodies, the Ministry of Justice, Public Security, and not state security. You know, I, uh, when I go to Beijing, I, I don't see the state security uh, ministry, but they see me, so I'm, uh, I'm not too worried about that. <laughs> and of course, overseen, overseen by members of the Standing Committee. And I should also say here, and I omitted, uh, not purposely, but uh, the role played by uh, then Party Secretary Zhang Zemin, who embraced this approach, uh, in contrast somewhat to his successors. The successful implementation of this strategy played an important role in China's successful effort to thwart uh, sanctions and avoid censure. Had China lost access to the United States market in the early 1990s, it is doubtful that the economic miracle uh, that we have seen would have taken place. Uh, this is a very rough way of looking at it, but if you use U.S. Department of Commerce statistics, if you were to add up the surpluses that China has gained, and I, I stress this is Department of Commerce, roughly equivalent to, uh, to China's current foreign exchange holdings. Uh, so that's, and that's, as you probably know, in the range of three to four trillion dollars. Uh, so making limited but timely concessions uh, has helped achieve other foreign policy goals as well, including uh, successful state visits and the hosting of the Olympic Games. Now, in recent years, China has walked back from these uh, concessions made in the wake of uh, Tiananmen. Uh, these days, uh, prisoners are rarely granted clemency. Prisoner lists are, for the most part, no longer accepted in bilateral dialogues. And uh, China's Ministry of Justice, which, as you probably know, uh, runs China's roughly 700 prisons, uh, has shown no sign of allowing the ICRC to exercise its mandate in the prisons it, it administers. Now, if, if you've got any questions, please save them for the end, but this is a good area to explore. You know, what, when I say the ICRC's mandate, well, what does that mean? All right. Uh, we can go into that later. It is uh, too soon to conclude, however, that the Chinese government will not make uh, human rights gestures to achieve foreign policy goals in the future, nor should we dismiss out of hand the connection between internal reform and external uh, advocacy. A, le a lesson of post Tiananmen human rights policy is that the exercise of clemency is good for China and is conducive to the broader acceptance of the country's peaceful rise as a responsible power committed to upholding international standards of human rights. In March of 1989, Lhasa erupted in protest and martial law was declared. The next month, in April, protests turned violent, and they took place in Xi'an and Changsha. On April the 22nd, students occupied Tiananmen Square. They were joined by workers and other citizens. As May drew to a close, martial law was declared in Beijing. After a six-week standoff, uh, China's leadership sent troops to clear the square. Many died. Thousands were detained. Events in Beijing led to unrest in hundreds of cities across China. Offenses committed after the declaration of martial law in Beijing and during unrest in other cities are known in the parlance of uh, China's judiciary as two disturbances cases. Now, if, any, if I reveal anything that you don't know today, it may be this. Uh, this is what these cases are referred to uh, by China's judiciary. Two disturbances cases. I should note the cases uh, 
that uh, arise from the Changsha and the Xi'an protests are not uh, considered two disturbances cases. In the spring of 1989, the People's Republic of China was not quite 40 years old. It was entering its middle age, facing its worth, worst political crisis, its darkest hours. Uh, Dante famously writes in the opening lines of the Inferno, midway in the journey of our life, I found myself in a dark wood with no direction forward. The straight way was lost. China had entered a dark wood. It had lost its way. I entered that dark wood with it, abandoning my business career in favor of human rights activism. It is hard to imagine today how poor, underdeveloped, and weak China was in 1989. Its per capita income was under $500, and it actually dropped in 1990. Trade was small. Two-way trade with Belgium was greater in the United States than with China, if you can imagine that. Uh, and foreign investment was almost non-existent, not to say non-existent, but it wasn't much. Unlike today, China had very few friends in the business community, and that affected its ability to lobby against sanctions. And its military was weak, barely holding its own in the brief border war with Vietnam. International reaction to what happened was quick, and it was furious. China overnight became a pariah. There was an immediate and very sharp drop in China's popularity in the United States, as recorded by the Gallup poll. In February of 1989, 72% of Americans had a favorable image of China. Six months later, in August, 34% of Americans, so a greater than 50% drop in favorability. Now, the, uh, the Gallup numbers actually show a strong correlation between uh, human rights gestures, or the lack of them, and uh, China's popularity. The last two readings in the Gallup poll for 2013 and 2014 uh, have China, uh, China's favorability rating stuck at 42% a mere eight points above where it was after uh, Tiananmen. And China's image fell, of course, as the uh, popularity of uh, communist countries in Eastern Europe threw off communism. So you had a situation where China was seen as one of the last communist countries, while Europe, Eastern Europe was becoming less communist. Of particular concern to China was the passage of a res resolution in the United Nations uh, Subcommission on the Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities in the late summer of 1989. That resolution called on China to grant clemency to those jailed in the spring protests. The resolution asked the Human Rights Commission to investigate the crackdown. This, it was the first time uh, that uh, alleged rights abuses in a Perm 5 country were referred to the United Nations' highest human rights body. Immediately after the events of June 4, 1989, the U.S. and EU imposed an arms embargo on China, one that remains in place to the present day. President uh, George H.W. Bush imposed a variety of other sanctions, banning high-level meetings, prohibiting OPEC, TDA funding, and so on, but uh, left intact China's most favored nation trading status. Uh, under the Trade Act of 1974, that status had to be renewed every year. And completely coincidentally, that status had to be uh, renewed no later than June 4th of every year. So in the first quarter of 1990, uh, Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi, she was actually serving her first term. Uh, she had been appointed with the death of Phil Burton and his wife, uh, but she actually was elected by her 
district to a full term, uh, first time in 1989, 1988. Uh, so, you know, uh, Nancy Pelosi's political career began on the national stage uh, with this effort to put conditions, and she introduced legislation with George Mitchell to do this on China's MFN. Their legislation passed Congress, both houses, in 1991 and in 1992. In 1990, it passed the House, but it died on the floor of the Senate before it was voted on. Uh, but the 91 and 92 U.S.-China Policy Act, both were vetoed by the President, President H.W., George H.W. Bush. A little bit of history. That veto was sustained in large part because a coalition uh, put together by then Senator, now Ambassador, Max Baucus, uh, voted to sustain the President's veto. Early in Bill Clinton's presidency, uh, in May of 1993, he released an executive order which in effect adopted the uh, conditions in the Pelosi-Mitchell legislation. Uh, these conditions were divided into must-meet conditions and so-called overall significant progress. So the must-meet were that uh, China had to substantially promote freedom of emigration under the Trade Act and to observe the terms of the MOU on prison labor. Uh, the overall significant uh, progress conditions uh, were uh, significant progress in adhering to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, releasing and providing an acceptable accounting of those imprisoned or detained for June 4th and democracy wall protests, granting access to international humanitarian and human rights organizations to China's prisons. International, human right, uh, international humanitarian organizations is code for ICRC. Uh, protecting Tibet's distinctive religious and cultural heritage and permitting international radio and television broadcasts into China. So those, that's the package of conditions. In my own work, I chose to concentrate on the second of the significant overall progress conditions, that is releasing and accounting of prisoners detained and imprisoned during the two disturbances and a democracy wall. Later, I branched out, uh, working in such areas as uh, Roman Catholics and uh, Tibetans. Well, China's initial response to international criticism was, was uh, unyielding, very hard. Now, I got a dose of this uh, when I first intervened on behalf of a young detainee in May of 1990 uh, at a banquet uh, on my way to Washington to testify at the first hearings. I was accused of committing an unfriendly act, crude interference in China's internal affairs that had hurt the feelings of all Chinese present. Uh, I held my ground, and I returned to Hong Kong uh, from testifying at the uh, first congressional hearings that Steve Solars uh, held on May 15th and 16th, 1990. And when I returned, uh, I was told that the detainee would be released and allowed to return to Hong Kong. The initial uh, hardline reaction on the part of Chinese officials gradually gave way to a more nuanced approach in mid-1991. Uh, the response included a forceful argument that uh, human rights should not be linked to trade, as well as making limited human rights concessions, in particular the release of prisoners. As noted, the response was approved by Deng Xiaoping. Only Deng Xiaoping could have uh, overcome opposition to releases from the military and from conservative elements uh, in the leadership. As I mentioned, this was overseen by the Standing Committee of the Politburo, uh, members including Zhu Rongji and Li Rui Huan, both of whom I met in 1990 and 91. I met Li Rui Huan in the Great Hall, uh, and it received uh, fairly wide coverage in the media. Strategy was managed by the State Council Information Office and implemented by the MFA, cooperation with judicial bodies. So by the time I next intervened on behalf of a couple of detainees in May 1991, the attitude on the part of Chinese officials had changed remarkably. Uh, there was no talk of interfering in China's internal affairs, and both were detained 
and they came down to Hong Kong. Again, I want to stress that this approach was, uh, was embraced by uh, Party Secretary Jiang Zemin um, in marked contrast to his uh, successors. Central to China's human rights diplomacy in the early 1990s were the releases of prisoners detained during the two disturbances and the earlier democracy war movement. A uh, popular misconception is that these uh, releases were uh, only uh, given or granted to a relatively small number of high-profile prisoners um, and that there were time for maximum impact on the MFN debate. In fact, large numbers of prisoners were granted early release in the aftermath of Tiananmen, many with little or no publicity, in part because it was very few of their names were known. Um, several releases were apparently not timed to the MFN debate. And now I'm, gonna re I'm going to reveal something which I don't think has been revealed before. According to statistics published in the judicial records of Hunan province, approximately 1,600 individuals nationwide were sentenced to prison for offenses committed in the two disturbances. Now, I want to make clear here, I'm talking about people actually imprisoned, not detained or arrested, not those sent to RTL, not those who were released having gotten credit for time served. As you probably know, in China, sentences are dated from the date of detention. So if you are uh, held in detention for two years and you get a two-year sentence, you're released. And I know of several examples of that. So 1,600. The largest number of these prisoners was in Hunan province, 133 in all. Of this number, 33 were imprisoned for counter-revolution, 43 for robbery, 57 for hooliganism. As you probably know, counter-revolution and hooliganism were removed from the criminal law in 1997. By March of 1993, more than half of these prisoners had been released, many before the expiration of their terms. As some were released after their sentences were reviewed and reduced by courts. Uh, other provinces, including Zhejiang, emptied their prisons of most two disturbances prisoners by mid-1993. According to our prisoner database, Dui Huang has received official information on 132 two disturbances prisoners. Of this number, 70 were released early by means of sentence reduction, parole or medical parole. To the best of our knowledge, only one two disturbances prisoner remains in prison today. Throughout 1993, China released the remaining democracy wall activists serving prison terms for counter-revolutionary crimes, including, uh, in this order, Wang Shijie, Xu Wenli, and Wei Jingsheng. Starting with a list of more than 800 names as submitted by the U.S. State Department prior to Secretary of State James Baker's November 1991 visit, uh, the Chinese government has accepted lists totaling thousands of names. Um, since our establishment as a foundation in 1999, I, I was doing this work for nine years before I set up the foundation. So, We alone, Doi Hua, has submitted lists with more than 5,000 names on them. In recent months, the Chinese government has refused to accept prisoner lists in human rights dialogues or during high-level state visits, though there have been exceptions. Increasing demands on the Ministry of Justice to provide information on prisoners led the ministry to issue a notice on establishing a reporting system on so-called important prisoners in April 1995. Um, in February of that year, 1995, I went to Beijing and I handed over a summary of the information I had received in 1994 to the State Council and the Ministry of Justice. I asked uh, 
well, what do you think? And they uh, replied that uh, you have reported uh, accurately what you were told. And at that point, I said, look, let's, let's make a deal. Uh, throughout 1995, I will submit four lists of 25 names each. This became known as the list of 100. And uh, you'll do your best to provide information. And we shook on, we shook on it. So it, it was an agreement. Um, and this uh, list of uh, two disturbances prisoners um, issued by the Ministry of Justice in April of 1995 included uh, two disturbances prisoners and uh, Catholic underground Catholic clergy. Uh, so the ministry and the subordinate prison administration bureaus have from time to time updated this list. Uh, and as I mentioned before, in November 1993, China's uh, foreign minister, Chen Chi-chan, stated that China would give positive consideration to requests by the ICRC to visit China's prisons. And at this point, China was well aware of the terms of the ICRC mandate. Although the ICRC has developed cooperative uh, relationships with the Chinese government, uh, the goal of visiting prisons uh, under its mandate has proven elusive. Now, to demonstrate its commitment to discussing human rights on the basis of equality and mutual respect, China began holding human rights dialogues with Western countries uh, and later Japan in 1991. First dialogues were with the United States and Switzerland, but over time, the number of dialogue countries expanded to nine. At its universal periodic review held in Geneva in October 2013, China stated that every year it holds consultations and dialogues with 20 countries. It was on the margins of these dialogues that China accepted, until recently, lists of uh, prisoners about whom their partner in the dialogue wanted information. So the State Council issued its first uh, white paper on uh, human rights in China in November of 1991. And this was been, uh, followed by white papers on specific topics like prison conditions, religious freedom in Tibet. Issuance of white papers on human rights has become an annual affair, as has the release of a human rights report critiquing the human rights situation in the United States. And the latter is released as soon as possible after the issuance of the annual human rights report by the State Department. And the very first report on human rights in the United States was released in 1998. In tandem with other steps, and I'm not saying that the only reason China held on to its MFN was because it was making human rights gestures. By no, I'm not saying that. Uh, for instance, it certainly helped uh, when China abstained on the use of force resolution in 1991 on the Iraq war. Uh, I find the parallels with Ukraine very interesting. So they abstained on both. Um, and also, uh, they began sending large buying missions to the United States, and that helped. But when you put this all together, uh, the successful effort uh, to uh, retain access to the U.S. market uh, laid the groundwork for China's strong economic growth, especially after Deng Xiaoping's southern trip in 1992. The package of reforms that followed that trip drew the attention of multinational corporations in Washington, and that in turn led to their more robust lobbying efforts. Now, uh, the uh, MFN debate was hardly the first time. Well, it was the first time, but it was hardly the only time that China uh, used uh, human rights gestures to uh, achieve foreign policy goals. Just to give a few examples, to influence the decision of the Olympic Committee on which city would host the 2000 Olympics, uh, China released most of the imprisoned Catholic clergy in 1992 and 93 to help ensure the success of state visits. Uh, and I give just a couple of examples, but uh, just to name one, uh, China released uh, the Tibetan uh, nun, Awang Songbril, uh, prior to Jiang Zemin's 2002 state visit. And this, uh, I find, uh, at least as interesting as the whole MFN reaction. Uh, after 9-11, uh, roughly from January of 2002 to March of 2005, 
um, in the wake of 9-11, China released large numbers of prisoners. Uh, in the summer of 2001, uh, what had happened was that Secretary uh, Powell had gone to Beijing. And uh, if you look at the record, one of the things that came out of that was uh, a decision to resume the human rights dialogue. And so in preparation for that, uh, Lauren Craner, who was an assistant secretary, put together a list, uh, 91 names, about 50 of which uh, Dwei Hua contributed. We concentrated only on counter-revolutionary prisoners. This was part of an effort I was undertaking to get uh, counter-revolutionary prisoners released under Article 16 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, that uh, article, actually the third paragraph, states that uh, uh, prisoners who have been convicted of a crime, the penalty uh, for which has been reduced, are to benefit. So I argued that the penalty for the crime of counter-revolution had been reduced, in fact eliminated, uh, after 1997. And very interesting, the Ministry of Justice told me at the time they agreed with my analysis, but uh, they pointed out that, uh, as in the United States, uh, prisoners do not necessarily benefit from a reduction in penalties. And you've seen a good example of that fairly recently with uh, you know, the crack cocaine, cocaine cases. Um, of course, in the United States, we have something called habeas corpus. So if a uh, penalty is eliminated, your lawyer goes to a judge and says, you know, your honor, China does not have, have habeas corpus. Um, so this three years plus of uh, wide scale prisoner releases ended in March of 2005 with the release of uh, Rabia Qadir. And that release contributed to the U.S. dropping its country re resolution at the final meeting of the Human Rights Commission before it uh, became the Human Rights Council. And finally, just as a final example, uh, the American prisoner Jude Shao, who was serving a 16-year sentence in Shanghai for tax evasion, uh, Jude was released on parole, not medical parole, parole, uh, stayed with his mother in Shanghai. And this was done to ensure uh, George Bush's attendance at the opening ceremony of the Olympics in 2008. You may recall European leaders were threatening to boycott. And George Bush said, no, I'm going. And Ju Xiao was released. The Obama administration has benefited from very few human rights gestures. All right? Most notably, the American uh, prisoner Shui Feng, who's the only American serving a sentence for endangering state security in a Chinese prison, he has not been released. Despite repeated pleas by senior American officials, including President Obama, Vice President Biden, and so on. And despite the fact that he has uh, roughly one year left on a sentence, eight-year sentence, uh, commuting sentences with just one year left uh, is very common in China, especially if the prisoner has demonstrated good behavior, and, and, Ju, uh, and Shui Feng has already gotten a sentence reduction for good behavior, so he is being well behaved. Um, hopefully, despite uh, recent tensions between the two countries on human rights, uh, Shui Feng will be released, his sentence commuted, so he can return to his family, his young family, and his wife. Prior to the visit of a Chinese state leader uh, two years ago, a senior American official asked his Chinese counterpart which prisoners would be released to ensure the visit's success. And the response was, uh, no one will be released. We don't have to do that anymore. So now let me say a few words about the present state uh, China has, relatively speaking, de-emphasized uh, bilateral human rights dialogues in favor of multilateral engagement at the United Nations. Uh, China fielded a large team for its second uh, UPR, 
and shortly afterwards was elected to a new term on the United Nations Human Rights Council. Uh, unlike in the Human Rights Dialogues, China has been willing to respond to requests for information uh, from so-called special procedures of the Human Rights Council. And at its UPR, uh, China claimed to respond to more than 80% of inquiries uh, by uh, special procedures. And I have no reason to doubt this. I've been told essentially the same thing by the UN Human Rights Council actually the Office of the High Commissioner. Uh, China also announced at the UPR that it would invite the working group on the issue of discrimination against women uh, in law and practice before the end of 2013, and it did so. And it pledged to invite three more special procedures uh, to, to visit in 2014. Uh, the last visit prior to the December visit of the working group on the issue of discrimination against women was actually November 2010, so it was a three-year gap uh, between visits of any special procedure. Over the last 12 months, China has held human rights dialogues, bilateral dialogues, or consultations with uh, the EU, Germany, uh, the United States, Switzerland, Australia, and uh, the Netherlands. After a, a hiatus of two years, reflecting Beijing's displeasure with the meeting between uh, David Cameron and the Dalai Lama, uh, there will be a round of the UK dialogue next month, and probably a round with the EU in around June. Hasn't been fixed. The fate of the US-China human rights dialogue, on the other hand, is unclear. I have heard dark mutterings that this year's round uh, will be uh, canceled on account of the meeting between the President and the Dalai Lama. I hope this will not be the case. There is precedent. In 1999, after the Belgrade Embassy bombing, the dialogue was suspended. But it would, if it happens, it supports the view that uh, Beijing no longer sees human rights dialogues as a concession, but rather as a favor. I was advised, I have been advised, that a policy decision was made in mid-2012 to no longer accept prisoner lists on the margins of bilateral dialogues. Recent discussions in Beijing indicate some flexibility in enforcing this policy but the age of submitting long lists is over. Uh, China refused to accept a long list from the EU in June of 2013. Uh, moreover, the MFA has drawn a distinction between accepting lists and replying to lists. Uh, if you get your list accepted, the chance of getting a response is very small. Uh, in recent years, China has pushed back hard at Western critics to its human rights record, demanding and getting equal time to criticize their dialogue partner's own failings. Until recently, such counterattacks took place behind closed doors. But at the conclusion of the dialogue with Australia held in Beijing recently, China's vice ministry strongly criticized uh, Australian policy towards migrants. So what's next? I expect in coming years China will place even more emphasis on working within the United Nations system and will continue to de-emphasize bilateral human rights dialogues and consultations. Instead of rights dialogues, China will more willingly engage in so-called legal expert exchanges, like the ones it holds with the US and the EU. By focusing more on issues of law, sensitive cases can be raised as questions as opposed to criticisms. The effect can be the same. Those whose names are too often forgotten are remembered. China will also be more willing to engage on issues of civil rights uh, rather than uh, those 
exclu associated exclusively with freedom of speech and association. Important reforms of the criminal justice system have taken place in recent years, like uh, the reduction of torture and the improvement in access, due process rights access by most detainees, including those at risk, such as juveniles and women. As was seen with the abolition of re-education through labor, the country will publicize its human rights reforms. Much work still needs to be done to abolish other forms of detention without trial, like custody and education, legal education centers, et cetera, that have no basis in Chinese law. China's officials are hampered by state secret laws in taking credit for what is arguably the greatest advance in human rights in recent years. Well, at least uh, insofar as most of the people of the world, not the United States necessarily, and that is the sharp reduction in the number of executions. It should embrace transparency and let tell the world how many people are sentenced to death, how many people are executed. Reforms of the one child per family policy and the household registration system have begun, but here too, much work needs to be done. Changes in China, as in other countries, come mostly from within, propelled forward by acts of courage, big and small, by officials and members of civil society alike. International concern, expressed as pressure, or perhaps more, uh, importantly, engagement through dialogue has contributed to reform of the criminal justice system, whether in reducing the number of executions or in improving treatment of society's most vulnerable members, like juvenile offenders and women in prison. Dwei Hua has worked closely with the Supreme People's Court and other governmental and non-governmental bodies in the latter two areas. And you, some of you may have gotten my, uh, our newsletter. If you didn't get it, you can find it on the website. But uh, uh, we held an international symposium on the rights of women in prison in Hong Kong at the end of last month. And we had a very good turnout, nine countries, 25 experts, uh, 30 observers. The largest contingent was from China. And, uh, I'd be very happy to tell you more about our initiative in the area of women in prison if you're interested. In closing, I would like to remind China's leaders of the benefits the country gained by releasing political and religious prisoners. China's use of clemency through the 1990s and into the middle years of the last decade encouraged the view that China was moving in the direction of greater restraint, tolerance, and humanitarian treatment of prisoners. The exercise of clemency is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of confidence and strength. In the words of Shakespeare, mercy is mightiest in the mightiest. It is an attribute to God himself when mercy Seasons Justice. Thank you. Do you want to take questions, or should I just? Uh... Uh, no, I'll do it. That's okay. fine. Well, thank you, John. That was a, a fantastic presentation. Uh, as stated in the uh, flyer that everybody hopefully got today, one of the reasons why we established uh, the Reality Check series is to take on issues that are controversial or are poorly understood in Washington or perhaps are not getting enough attention in the community. And I think your very thorough presentation has kind of uh, checked all three of those boxes. So I appreciate uh, you doing that in a very balanced way. Let me uh, seize the uh, powers of the chair to ask you the first question, uh, and then we'll move on to the audience. I'm struck by the comments you made about how uh, there's a sense developing uh, uh, among Chinese officials that you know those days are past in terms of these targeted releases and so on. And, and the, the comment by the one official in particular is quite striking that they don't have to do that anymore. Uh, 
what is your sense of the policy implications for the United States' approach to human rights dialogue uh, with China, given that new reality? I'd appreciate your views on that. Yes, well, um, as I mentioned in uh, May of last year, uh, the European Union uh, tried to hand over one of these big lists, uh, 200 names, and they were rebuffed uh, very strongly. Uh, it was a very fractious meeting, I understand, between the two sides, but in the end, the Chinese side refused to accept the list. Along comes the United States. We, uh, we go out to Kunming for the dialogue, and there, too, the Chinese side resisted accepting the list. I understand in the end the list was accepted, uh, but uh, only because the US uh, used an argument which is very, I think, in line with China's own positions over the years. Well, uh, you know, a dialogue is just what it says, and the US had been presenting these lists since 1991, and now how can one partner in the dialogue unilaterally state no more. So I think that argument carried the day, uh, but let me say this, if in fact this year's dialogue is canceled, mm -hmm. I think uh, that will pretty much put an end uh, to uh, the United States uh, submitting lists unless uh, the U.S. Uh, makes it a condition of the resumption of the dialogue and then again, China may say, well, no. Mm -hmm. In 1999, uh, well, we had the Belgrade bombing. The dialogue was suspended. It, be, re, it began again. Mm -hmm. um, but then in 2003, the United States canceled the dialogue on the grounds that not enough had been accomplished mm -hmm. in the previous rounds. And it took, what was it, five years mm -hmm. to get it started again. I should also point out that uh, Canada also took the step of uh, suspending its dialogue on human rights with China, and they have yet to be able to resume. Uh, so I would say that if, in fact, the uh, next round of the dialogue does not take place, the chance that uh, the United States is going to be able to hand over a large list is, is remote. Now, as I mentioned, there are exceptions. And I've been uh, working with various countries to see if we can figure out a way to do this. Uh, and I do think the approach should be one of uh, uh, stressing legal uh, matters. Uh, so instead of uh, cases of concern, uh, you hand over a list of issues of interest and under each issue, you have a few examples, OK? Uh, you can use your imagination. There are plenty of possible uh, issues and cases. That's one way. Uh, secondly, um, I understand that uh, I've been told that uh, in, in the event of high-level state visits, then a small lists of cases can be accepted by the geographic department concerned. Mm -hmm. So as you know, we're in what's called Medasu. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if a you know, vice president or the president goes to China, the Chinese will, the Chinese side will accept a list. Mm -hmm. uh, Well, and finally, uh, I have been told that uh, not as a policy decision, but uh, on, on personal grounds, uh, the Chinese government is willing to accept lists from me. So I've continued to do that. And in the past year, I've received detailed information on 50 cases. Okay, uh, we'll open it up to the audience now. As uh, per usual CSIS practice, if you would please uh, identify yourself when asking your question, and please do ask a question rather than deliver a speech. Uh, we'll take the first one. Yes, ma'am, right here in the middle. Thank you so much. Can you wait for the microphone, please? Oh, Thank you. 
Thank you so much. It's an honor to hear you. I'm Ruth Kurtzbauer, retired Foreign Service Officer, many tours of duty in Beijing. And two questions, my actually ties into what you said at the end, uh, Mr. Kam. Uh, as you know, you know, not only State Department, but many NGOs, other organizations, universities, et cetera, have conducted a lot of exchanges with uh, legal persons and personalities in China. And we often wondered, I was involved in some of them, is there really an impact? You know, judges come over and, and senior scholars come over and bright young uh, academics come over to the United States in the legal field, but what is the impact in China? Your last remark was, if there is a way through legal dialogues and stressing the intellectual uh, framework of law uh, exists, then perhaps all these, all these uh, programs have great merit. I, the individuals have been wonderful. I've had the privilege of meeting them, but I often wondered in the end, is, uh, are they heard when they go back, whether it's a Humphrey Fellow, whether it's a judge's exchange, are they heard? And second, totally unrelated question was, when you talked about the, um, the uh, prisoners who were released after Tiananmen, is there any impact on their lives if they've been to disturbance former prisoners, or do they just live their life as anyone else in China? Thank you. Well, let me, let me take the last question first, because the, the first question is going to require a little bit of uh, speechifying on my, on my part. In, in, in China, uh, there's a, uh, a police term uh, known as Jungdian uh, Renko, which I translate as uh, in, important uh, population or uh, targeted, I call it targeted population. And Jungdian Renko is a term that, uh, well, you might think of it as uh, the usual suspects. So people who have served sentences uh, for counter-revolution or endangering state security, among others, uh, are added to the list of uh, targeted population, Jung And uh, these people uh, are kept under a close watch uh, by, uh, by the security uh, people. Um, also, as you no doubt know, that in China you have a supplemental s sentence of deprivation of political rights and uh, that can be as long as eight years. I've seen eight-year sentences of DPR, but typically it's in the three to five-year range. And for people who have DPR, uh, there are a whole bunch of things they are not permitted to do. Uh, they can't give speeches, give interviews. They can't uh, run for public office. Uh, they can't work in state-owned enterprises, etc. So uh, the answer is, you know, no, once you have served uh, time for uh, political cases, political offenses, um, your life is never uh, normal again, never. Um, and that said, there are plenty of examples of people who have come out of prison and who have uh, become successful business people, um, private enterprise. Uh, and they travel abroad, and uh, you know they they seem not to have been terribly affected. Now, with respect to the first, in roughly 2005, I made a strategic decision to move into areas other than what I had been working in. And at first, I started working on death penalty. Uh, I chaired the plenary session at the Third International uh, Conference on the Abolition of the Death Penalty in Paris. And uh, I, my approach to reducing the number of executions, I, I'm opposed to capital punishment. Uh, my approach uh, has been to uh, publicize uh, our estimates of the number of executions. And uh, that is because I know for a fact that many people in the Chinese government uh, are embarrassed by the large number of executions and uh, have made a commitment to reducing it, and they have. Uh, I estimate that in 2002, uh, there were uh, 12,000 executions, and in 2012, there were 3,000. That's a 75% drop. Uh, in addition, we have taken up the cases of individuals uh, condemned to death, uh, had 
I can't say we had successes. I mean, the international community has weighed in heavily, as well as domestic forces. Of course, you probably know the biggest case right now is the case of Li Yen, a woman uh, convicted of murder, murdering her husband, who was a brute and a serial wife abuser, uh, boasted of abusing his three previous wives, well, a fourth time unlucky. Uh, he came after her, and he had uh, brutally abused her repeatedly. And he, uh, unfortunately for him, he was drunk. And she grabbed the rifle out of his hand and uh, proceeded to dispatch him, uh, after which she dismembered the body. Uh, she was sentenced to death. At the end of uh, 2011, the appeal was rejected at the end of 2012, and the Supreme Court is still considering it, which is more than a year later. That gives me hope that her death sentence uh, might be commuted, in fact. That would be a tremendous uh, victory for the rights of women who are being abused, which, as you know, the Supreme People's Court just gave a press conference in which it released the statistics that 25% uh, of Chinese women uh, suffer abuse in their marriages. And one in 10 homicides is directly related to domestic violence. So if she, in fact, has her sentence commuted, that will send a very strong message uh, and uh, will propel forward passage of a law on domestic violence, which is now being considered by the National People's Congress. Um, and in fact, uh, there were officials from the Chinese Supreme Court at our international symposium, one of the topics of which was domestic violence. Uh, and I believe that uh, what those officials uh, heard uh, was important to this consideration. Finally, I think I can think of really no better example of how international exchanges on human rights uh, have contributed to important domestic legal reforms in China than uh, juvenile justice. In 2007, I hosted uh, the visit to the Bay Area of a Chinese prison inspector. And it was really a, a, quite an eye-opener uh, for me as well as for him. I mean, we went into San Quentin, and uh, that uh, you've got to see that to believe it. Um, but as we visited the detention center under the, uh, well, adjacent to, actually, uh, the San Francisco Juvenile Court, this official said, well, do you, you know, John, uh, reforming the juvenile justice system is a key priority of the Chinese government. I said, I didn't know that. He said, well, why don't you, uh, why don't you uh, meet with your friends in the Supreme Court? Well, indeed, uh, it, it was in the legal plan as a top priority to reform the system. Uh, as you know, one of the unintended consequences of China's uh, economic reforms and growth has, has in fact been a very sharp rise in the number of uh, juvenile offenders. Uh, and a majority of them, especially in the coastal areas, are the children of migrant workers. Yeah. It, uh, it's amazing. It mirrors very much the history of juvenile justice reform in this country in the late 1800s, 1890, when immigrants from Italy, uh, other countries came to the United States. They didn't speak the language. They couldn't get into school. And that's very similar in China. They come in from Sichuan to Shanghai. They don't speak the local language. They can't get into school. They turn to crime. Uh, so the numbers were just soaring uh, in China. So the government uh, took upon itself to reform the system. So they began to work with uh, overseas organizations, governments, what have you. And Dwei Hua was chosen. And we worked with the Supreme Court, uh, what's known as the Working Group on Juvenile Courts. They came to this country in uh, 2008 and went around the country, came here to Washington, met with Justice Kennedy, uh, 
who is, uh, perhaps you know, a towering figure in uh, the history of juvenile justice reform in the Roper decision. He changed his vote uh, to make uh, execution of individuals for crimes committed before the age of 18 unconstitutional. So that was a, a wonderful session. And so they returned to China, wrote up their report, it circulated at high levels, and then uh, they asked us to visit China in 2010. And again, we went around, we had seminars, we visited prisons and courts. And then uh, in uh, 2012, as uh, we were preparing to host another delegation, out comes the draft criminal procedure law. And I was astonished. Virtually all of the major reforms in the juvenile justice system in China uh, were introduced uh, through international exchanges. And in particular, um, what you will see in that law uh, mirrors the American system. Uh, we have something called diversion in this country, you know, and just as the name implies, you try to divert the juvenile from the path to prison, right? And I won't go into all the details, but it's called diversion. In China, they called it postponed prosecution, and the concept is the same. You reach an agreement with the DA's office that you will do this, 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 and this over a six-month period. You'll stay away from those bad people. Uh, you'll stop drinking and smoking pot, and uh, you will be tested. And I've been on these uh, visits, by the way, with police teams, and they show up unannounced at the juvenile's house, and, you know, he's tested, and he's checked out. They go into his room, et cetera, et cetera. And if after six months you honor your side of the agreement, your records are sealed, which is a misnomer. They're actually expunged. China is adopting sealing of records. It has adopted diversion. It has adopted behavioral and psychological assessments at all stages of adjudication. It has put in place more protections, especially for female juveniles. They can no longer be interrogated by male officers. Now, all these things are features of the US system. I can think of no better example than the impact of international human rights exchanges on China's laws than the reform of the juvenile justice system. Thank you. A uh, gentleman in the pink tie here. Hi, uh, thanks for doing this. Sean Tandon, I'm a reporter with AFP. Um, I just wanted to expand on Chris's question a bit. When you're talking about that lists are no longer um, uh, that you don't expect lists to be part of the, the process anymore. Why do you think that is? Do you think it's just a rising sense of confidence by China vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States? Um, is it because there's nothing transactional now, there's not an Olympics coming up? More broadly, what do you think are the reasons why this trend is becoming true? Hmm. Well, I think there are a number of reasons. Some have to do with the personnel. Uh, the current, uh, I mean, really, the resistance to accepting lists began uh, with the uh, uh, appointment of the current Minister of Justice, uh, Wu Aying. Uh, she is now the longest serving Minister of Justice in the history of the People's Republic. And she uh, very much didn't like this. Um, I am told that Party Secretary Hu Jintao also didn't like it, didn't like this list thing. Also, I think the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, you know, got to the point where uh, you know, they were accepting lists with hundreds of names. And one of the complaints was, you know, we have some other things to do than to run around and collect all this information for you folks. Another problem was, I would say, the wording of the lists. Uh, now, in contrast to, I, I must say, the way Dwayne Hua does lists, uh, some of these countries would uh, ask uh, about a prisoner in terms that uh, well, uh, the Chinese I felt was insulting. You know, it was sort of uh, the old, uh, uh, when did you stop beating your wife kind of question. Uh, so all kinds of allegations would be made about mistreatment that the Chinese side did not like. But yes, there's also the, the point that, uh, uh, well, just as the senior official said, we don't have to do it anymore. 
And that is the case. Uh, there really isn't anything uh, on the horizon that uh, China necessarily wants to the extent that it's willing to do this. I said, though, that doesn't mean that's always going to be the case. That may change. Um, but as it stands right now, uh, the days of the big lists are over. Uh, now, if you're going to pursue this, and I think it's worthy of pursuit, we're going to have to play this a lot smarter. Uh, you can't, you know, you've you got to focus on the, those cases you think that are most important. Uh, you've got to phrase your lists in a certain way. You should uh, embed the requests in uh, points of law. And if you do all that, I think, in fact, you can manage to raise cases. And again, um, look. Uh, the human rights dialogue is not the only venue for discussing human rights. You have a strategic and economic dialogue. And actually, one of the reasons I hope that the human rights dialogue is not canceled or suspended uh, is that uh, those issues can, in fact, be addressed there, leaving time in the strategic and economic dialogue to talk about other things like North Korea, uh, little things like Syria, you know, these are the kind of issues that uh, would get more attention than will otherwise be the case. So it's not necessarily, I think, a good idea for China to do this. Uh, but I do think uh, it's highly likely that the, they can hardly suspend the UK for two years and do nothing in response to the president's meeting with the Dalai Lama. So I'm kind of resigned to that. Uh, we will, I will continue to carry on. I'm not a government. Although, as Tina Rosenberg put it in that article, you know, well, not in the article, she says, oh, come on, John, they treat you like a government. <laughs> <laughs> so. um, yes, ma'am. Just wait for the microphone, please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Reporter from The Voice of America. And, uh, my question for Mr. Kim. So, what do you say about China's human rights now under Mr. Uh, under President Xi Jinping's administration? Given that the China the party tightens sort of tightens its control on internet and freedom of speech. Thank you. I have always um, been reluctant. Um, I, I, frankly, I think it's intellectually dishonest uh, to make a, a sweeping, generalized statement about human rights in China. Uh, to state year after year, as you see, that uh, human rights has deteriorated in China over the last year, which I have seen repeatedly in reports by governments and NGOs. Well, you know, if human rights has deteriorated year by year, where is it now? I mean, that's the old limbo dance. You know, how low can you go? In fact, the truth is this. Uh, human rights in China moves forward and backward at the same time, in different places, at different paces. That's the truth. So I've just told you how uh, juveniles have benefited. In fact, in uh, 2013, uh, the percentage of youth who were given uh, non-custodial uh, punishments, in other words, they didn't go to prison, uh, rose uh, from 42 to 46 percent. Well, when you're dealing with 100,000 young people, that's 4,000 people who were spared prison. And I believe that uh, the number of executions went down. Uh, there are other examples. This uh, reform, the abolition of re-education through labor. As I pointed out, there are other forms of detention without trial. And yet in every one of those areas, you see legal reformers working to abolish them as well. You may have seen recently, for instance, that in Henan, uh, the police came up with this uh, reprimand centers. After public uh, outcry, the provincial government outlawed them. Uh, so we, we see this. Now, at the same time, curbs on freedom of speech and expression continue, and in some respects uh, have gotten worse. Uh, that's one of the problem areas. But it is, simply, it's, it is simply not the case 
that the overall situation is deteriorating. When I first came to Washington to work on human rights, it was at the time of the first MFN debate, I remember distinctly uh, members of uh, leading NGOs, including Chinese NGOs, and uh, government uh, officials and members of Congress uh, is saying with some certainty that uh, the Chinese government was uh, going to collapse, it, was, uh, it would be over within six months. In fact, I think somebody even wrote a book to that effect, The Coming Collapse of China. Well, guess what? They haven't. The Chinese government has proven to be far more resilient than their critics once believed. And why is that? Well, yes, uh, in part because the government has delivered the economic goods, no question, no question about it. At the same time, we ignore at our peril recognizing that in some areas, in fact, the government has carried out improvements in human rights and due process legal protection of rights. In the CPL, the criminal procedure law, almost all detainees, with the exception of endangering state security and a couple of others, have access to lawyers within 48 hours, okay? Interrogations are taped. Uh, there are important uh, movements in a positive direction in China. So now, uh, for the majority of Chinese people, the majority, the great majority of Chinese people, young people, women, their rights are being protected more than in the past. And that is one of the reasons why the Chinese government has proven to be so resilient. If, in fact, the rights of the Chinese people were getting worse year after year, I don't think, in fact, the Chinese government would have proven to be so resilient. And when we have dialogues with the Chinese, it's very important to recognize where there has been progress at the same time as we point out where more needs to be done. This is very important. It's, uh, unfortunately, our approach is to say, oh, we recognize you've, uh, you've really made a lot of advances in feeding and clothing the people. And I have to tell you, Chinese officials with whom I work feel that's really condescending. They don't need the United States to come here, you know, to come over there or come here and tell them that. They know that. You know, what you need to do is to say, okay, in, in, in respect to civil and political rights, right? here's where I think you're doing, you're, you're making some progress. Here's where I think you're not. And you, know, and, and you can say the same to us. And let's work together to help each other, all right? Instead of using dialogues to beat each other up. Used to be we did most of the beating. Now they've gotten real good at beating us up too. So it becomes this kind of a, uh, mutual uh, confrontational session. And, I, you know, I, I, I wrote a story for my newsletter a couple of newsletters ago in which I, it was uh, a human rights dialogues, an exercise in insanity, <laughs> which, you know, Einstein's definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. <laughs> uh, I understand some of my friends in the State Department were not too happy about that. But as I made a point, at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the article, I still come out in favor of the dialogues. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for that. Right here in the front. Thank you. My name is Yang Jian Li. Oh, Yang Jian Li, how and are you? I am um, a Tiananmen survivor and a former political prisoner of China from 2002 to 2007. Actually, Mr. Zhang Kim worked on my case as well. So I didn't have uh, uh, the privilege and honor to meet you in person until today. Thank so you. I want to take this opportunity to thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. And um, my question is, uh, when it comes to human rights foreign policy, there is a gen general assumption in the international community that if a country takes a strong human rights stan a stance on human rights with China, China will uh, retaliate economically with its rising economic power. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, is this, as you see, uh, 
a valid assumption or uh, just an untested assumption? Hmm. Well, uh, well, first of all, it's uh, nice, nice to meet you, <laughs> and uh, well, welcome home. Um, that's a good question. Uh, a lot depends on the overall environment, all right? If you're having a very productive relationship in, in some areas, uh, you can perhaps take a stronger stand uh, on human rights than you might uh, otherwise do. Uh, so if you have a very... Uh, notice, for instance, when the president met with uh, the Dalai Lama, on that very day, the United States was engaged in a high-level military exchange that was not affected at all. Uh, so it, it's a really, it's a hard one to read. I mean, the, the military to military relationship seems to be doing better. Uh, on the trade side, well, we still have plenty of problems, but trade is, is, is growing. Um, on security issues, well, there too, it's a mixed bag. I think a lot depends about, you know, the context of the whole relationship. Uh, some countries um, are, are able to uh, take stands that might be stronger than others uh, for various reasons. A lot, a lot has to do, of course, with what's going on in terms of domestic uh, politics in China. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that we often don't know what's going on and uh, the relative strengths of the different personalities. And that affects things. For instance, if the Ministry of Justice, uh, if the minister uh, retires after nine years uh, and someone else comes in, uh, that, may be, that may make a difference. Um, I think every country has to follow its collective conscience. Uh, sometimes it doesn't help to be a little too soft. Other times, it doesn't help to be a little too hard. You got to find the right balance, and it really comes down to leadership. Uh, I think initially, uh, the Obama administration, just as it did with another uh, superpower, wanted to reset uh, the relationship. And uh, as you will recall, uh, Secretary Clinton famously uh, said, uh, and I'm here, I'm just paraphrasing, that, well, we, you know, we will raise human rights, but we can't let it interfere with other uh, objectives. <laughs> objectives of the administration. <laughs> An honest answer, but it may have sent the wrong message. Uh, recently, I, I, I note uh, somewhat a stiffening of the, of the spine. Um, I think you're going to see the U.S. Uh, taking stronger positions than it did in the past. Um, I was very interested to see President Obama refer to China's record on religious freedom at the National Prayer Breakfast hmm. publicly. Uh, that had not happened before. Uh, so, and of course, the meeting with the Dalai Lama was the first in what three years. Mm -hmm. uh, so, we're in, and of course, the emphasis put on uh, visas for journalists, both in the Biden meetings and in Obama's meeting with Xi in Brussels. This is, I think, something new. Uh, so I, I actually see the administration becoming more forceful, ironically, at a time when, in many respects, we do need China's help uh, than necessarily in the past. For instance, on Ukraine, uh, well, Syria, but North Korea certainly. Uh, we, we do need China's assistance in these areas, and yet at the same time, we're taking, I think, a stronger position in many respects on human rights. So thank you for your question. Right here in the front. Thank you very much for a most enlightening lecture and for your many decades of dedication to human rights and the hundreds of political prisoners you have helped rescue. I'm Greg Scarlatti, Executive Director of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Congressman Solar, whom you mentioned in your lecture, was a founding board member and former co-chair. Ambassador Winston Lord is a very active member of the board of our organization. One of the toughest issues we face is the forcible repatriation of North Korean refugees by China. 
especially in cases where these refugees came across South Koreans, Christian missionaries, or in cases where North Korean women became pregnant with Chinese men along the road of defection, they face conditions of extreme danger, torture, imprisonment in political prison camps, sexual violence, forced abortions. Uh, um, what would your advice be to our organization and other organizations that are trying to enlist China's help? After all, if we manage to persuade China that this help on this issue would be aligned with China's international obligations under the 1951 Refugee Convention to which it adhered in 1982, if we manage to get some Chinese help on this issue, this would certainly be a tremendous step forward, possibly the greatest step forward we've ever seen in this uh, area of North Korean human rights. Well, thank you for the question, and thank you for the very good work you're doing in this area. I am, of course, familiar with the committee. Um, well, let me just recount a couple of stories for the sake of giving you some flavor. Uh, yes, I certainly have discussed this matter uh, with the Chinese government. And in fact, I was asked by the UN uh, committee uh, whether or not um, I uh, would, uh, oh, I think intercede is too strong a word, but to uh, to approach the Chinese government to uh, ask for assistance. And, and of course I said, I am, but, but please understand something. The uh, influence that Beijing exerts over North Korea is extremely limited, very, very limited, and getting more and more limited. Now, you saw, I think, recently the execution of uh, Kim Jong-un's uncle. He was very much a man who was uh, closely associated with the Chinese government. And he and all kinds of other people have been executed. And there's a history of this, as you know, in, in the DPRK. There have been over the decades this sort of pro-Russian, pro-Chinese faction you know, seeking influence. Well, uh, if what has happened is any measure of that, I would say right now, uh, the Chinese faction has been uh, essentially eviscerated. So you, you start with that. Uh, who is China going to talk to? Well, the people who've just gotten rid of <laughs> their faction. So, uh, you know, uh, one other point. Uh, years ago, uh, when I was in Geneva, I uh, went out to lunch with a pretty senior Chinese official. And he said to me, you know, we have let between three and 400 uh, North Koreans uh, leave the country uh, for other destinations. And by the way, what I'm about to say, I have heard on, on many other subjects, we get no credit for it, none. And yet we are risking this relationship with the North Koreans, uh, but nobody recognizes that. We've let so many out. And, and so there was that sense of frustration. Uh, but actually, um, oh, and one other thing, I happen to know that a very si a senior Chinese leader has asked the assistance of an international humanitarian organization uh, to help on issues with North Korea. Uh, you know, they almost shot down a Chinese airliner recently. Uh, they fired a missile, and it came within, I don't know, half a mile or a quarter of a mile of a Chinese airliner. Uh, so the relationship there is not good. It really is not good. Um, so can China do more? Well, to your point, sure. Uh, it can, and I believe over time they will. Uh, I think there are some people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who have very good knowledge of dealing with the North. Uh, and that over time, I am actually uh, quite optimistic that China will take a stronger position. They haven't yet. They haven't yet. And I'm waiting to see how they're going to ultimately react to the report. They do things differently, uh, certainly. But I don't know if you're aware of this. But uh, at China's UPR in October, as you may know, uh, states, parties, countries uh, have uh, time to make statements, recommendations. And uh, this time there were 
137 countries, each making statements for 50 seconds. The DPRK delegation rose to condemn China's re-education through labor system <laughs> and called for it to be abolished. So that is, I think, pretty telling. It's, uh, you know, it's, I, I think, rather unusual for North Korea to criticize China's human rights record and uh, not a little bit uh, of chutzpah <laughs> involved in that. So that's all to the point. I think we, we overstate uh, China's influence on North Korea. Okay, well, in the interest of time, I think we're gonna call it there. Uh, please join me in thanking John uh, for his fantastic presentation today.